basically occurring. It's very, very difficult to uh, think like this. Why, why is something this way? Uh, another thing about sepsis mortality is uh, uh, sepsis mortality is coming down. But the six-minute walk test, 70% of them fail. They can't even walk six minutes properly. That's how bad uh, mortality is all about. So 70% reduction uh, at five years. At five years after critical illness is what we're looking at. So yes, we are missing out on something. We are missing out on something. And, and the biggest problem is rise to acquired weakness and recovery from critical illness. This is this, this is a big problem that has that has cropped up because of we saving patients. And and Paul Vishpayar once said, you know, are we really creating survivors or are we creating victims? That was the statement that he said. Are we creating survivors? Or are we creating victims? So so he, he's he's really right about it. So let's meet James. He's a 70 year old gentleman. 70 year old gentleman, very nice, frankly, no problem per se. Um, but you know, James is going to lose 8 to 15 percent of his muscle mass per decade after 70 years. All of us sitting in this room, if you don't do anything, after 70 years per decade, after you become 80, you lose 15 percent of your muscle mass. All right, and believe me, what's your age, Ashok? 33. 33. Who's who above 40 here? Who is above 40? Above 40? <coughs> above 40? Uh, only two people above 40 here? All right. So, anyone above 40? and up to 60 would actually lose 23% of their muscle mass. Okay, between 40 and 60, people sitting in this room would probably lose 23% 20, of their muscle mass. It's very, very disturbing to know this, but it is that, it is that, that is what aging is all about. That is what aging is all about. So 24% is already lost by the time he's reached 70. By the time he's reached 70, he's lost already 24% of his muscle mass. All right, now this is called as age-related sarcopenia. This is what we call as age-related sarcopenia. Sarcopenia no means nothing but poverty of flesh. Yeah. That is what it, it, in Greek it means. It means that you're losing flesh, you're losing muscle. Okay, that's what sarcopenia is all about. And a person who was as young as this would go to as old as that very quickly if on top of age, he has something more like an illness. Okay, he would go from here to here quickly if he had something more uh, uh, on top of that. Now let's look at this. So on your x axis you have muscle mass, on your, uh, on your y axis you have muscle mass, on the x dash axis you have muscle function, and down there you have the age. Now what you're noting, noticing over here, in early adult life you actually are growing your muscles, your functions, and your muscle mass is actually going up. As you reach somewhere around 40 years, you start plateauing out. You start plateauing out. Now once you reach 70, you are actually going lower and lower. However, you're still above the disability threshold. <coughs> you're still above the disability threshold. That means you're not disabled yet. But what does happen when you have disuse, when you have hospital admissions, when you have convalescence after hospital admission, when you have more critically ill uh, uh, periods, when you start moving less, when you stop exercising, when you start eating less. This is what happens to an, any elderly person. You know all your parents. All your parents would be moving lesser than what they used to do when you were kids. Isn't it? Huh? If when you were kids, you would have seen your parent playing around with you. Now they don't. Isn't it? Then why don't they do that? It's, it's important that the adult also moves because if he disuses his muscle, this is what occurs. He actually disuses his muscle. The actual drop in muscle mass starts occurring quite early in life. <coughs> quite early in life. That is very, very important. Okay. And this drop in muscle mass will also occur when there is illness. Any form of illness. Let it be critical illness. Let it be uh, just a fever, cold pop, which makes you hospitalized. Because when you get hospitalized, what do you do? You sit. Okay, you sit. You sit, you rest. And that is what actually drops everything. And that is called as disease-related sarcopenia or nutrition-related sarcopenia. When, when a person actually has an illness. For example, our intensive care patients, they are inside the hospital. They are lying down, they are on a ventilator. You know, as, as early as the first 24 hours, you start losing ventilator, you, you start developing ventilator induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, you start losing muscle mass. Well, look at this uh, data. This was a very beautiful data that was done by uh, Professor Puducherry and from JAMA from 2013, a very old paper. But it's a beautiful paper. What it basically said on top is when you had single organ failure, see what you can see is a cross sectional area of the muscle. The, the, there's already a drop in the cross section area of the muscle in the first 10 days. You see that's 10 days. Okay, and the, on the on the x-axis you have day from day 1 to day 10. And if you have multi-organ failure, look, it's almost three times the amount that you lose muscle mass if you have multi-organ failure. So clearly there is a drop in just seven days. And what you see on this slide is a muscle biopsy. Okay, what you see here is cells and cells. This is immunostaining. 
What is seeing on that side is the present that this eosinophil stain is actually causing ne there's necrosis over there. There's necrosis, it's growing necrosis, it's, it's, it's breaking down, isn't it? So as early as first seven days, your muscle gets broken down, irrespective of what you do in critical illness. This is very, very clear. This is very, very clear. All right. Hmm? So we also did the same thing. You know? We also did a study of ours. And what did we find? We found very similar results. We looked at some 20, 30 or 30 odd patients. We looked at them, we examined their muscle mass. And, and what, we, what did we find? We found the same situation. What we found, 2.63 was the muscle mass on day one. This is the median muscle mass. And by day seven was 2.16, which is almost a 0.5 centimeter drop of muscle, clearly indicating that muscle mass is lost very, very early in critical illness. So, so this is something that is very, very dangerous. And why is it dangerous? It is dangerous because if there is a 10% lean body mass loss, even if there is a 10% lean body mass loss, there is immune, uh, impaired immunity and, and then there is increased infection. If there is a 20% body uh, lean body mass loss, there is decreased healing, weakness, infection, and thinning of the skin. Okay, if there is 30%, he is so weak, that he can't even sit. That he can't even sit. If he's so weak that he can't even sit on the chair, when he's 30 percent loss, and when he's 40 percent, death is usually from pneumonia. So we have such patients in our ICU. We regularly, we have such patients in our ICU, and we we start figuring how did they get a pneumonia? They get a pneumonia because there's there's no lean body mass. It's very clear. And importantly, do they also die? Yes, they do. If you look at the side on that side, the mortality goes up higher and higher as you lose lean body mass. It's a clear. Uh, understanding that lean body mass is related to mortality. So mortality does go up once the lean body mass goes down. Let me show you something more interesting. So we do deal with a lot of wounds in our hospital. Okay, we do a lot of wounds in our hospital. What is clear is when you lose around 10%, still the body takes the protein and tries to heal the wound. If you lose 10% lean body mass, still the body takes the, uh, you know, takes the protein out of the tissues and tries to heal the wound. This is what it is doing. But once you go beyond 10%, once you go beyond 10%, the body tries to become anabolic. It tries to prevent, it doesn't go to actually heal the wound, it actually goes to just build up the muscle. And when it goes to 30%, there's no way that even a single morsel of your protein would go inside the wound. So that's why I was saying that patient that was admitted into the ICU, you take him for, take that person for surgery, that patient will never, never and never heal. Are you getting the point? Because that is a patient who has more than a 40% lean body mass loss. Clear? There's a patient in the ICU which, that's this, this way. So that's 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 a very important statement that we need to make. And this per se is actually called as malnutrition sarcopenia syndrome, where you have decreased nutrient intake, which causes inflammation. Inflamation causes reduced intake again, reduced muscle mass, muscle strength, and decreased physical function. And that's uh, causes a whole lot of problems: anabolic resistance, difficult assimilation, mitochondrial failure, insulin resistance. It causes everything under the sun. Where and this syndrome, this entire syndrome that we have is actually called malnutrition sarcopenia syndrome. This entire syndrome that we have together is called as malnutrition sarcopenia syndrome. So you see the amount of problems it causes, even the reduction in blood flow occurs. So you may develop other problems with reduction of blood flow that occurs in such cases. There is impaired regeneration. So you don't expect the wounds to heal in your manner. It's not going to occur, it's never going to occur. All right, and that causes increased morbidity and mortality. So sarcopenia is a problem. We all know this, sarcopenia is definitely a problem. There's no doubt about it, sarcopenia is a problem. But how do you define? How do you define sarcopenia? Anyone can tell me how to define sarcopenia? Any way you can define, how you can define sarcopenia? Uh, Sachin, what do you think sarcopenia is all about? Loss of muscle mass. Loss of muscle mass, okay, but how do you define it? There has to be a definition, right? So how do you define that? So, so when, whenever you talk, talk about anything in diet, something that comes to our mind is always BMI, you know? Everything you think of is BMI. But it's important for you to understand when you're dealing with sarcopenia, you not you forget the BMI. It's never the BMI, and BMI forgotten in most of the other indices that we have. We've actually forgotten BMI. We don't look at BMI per se because there's beautiful papers that says, uh, like these, which actually says that irrespective of the BMI, irrespective of BMI, the patient's lean body mass would completely be different. You see that? There are three different individuals. Obesity is there, but their lean body mass is extremely different. The red color, what you see, is the lean body mass. So even though these individuals are different in size, but the lean body mass is very, very different. You can't really predict lean body mass based on <coughs> BMI, which is weight upon height square. You can't do that. It's not possible. That's why you need to measure the lean body mass. 
Okay, it's not possible to define sarcopenia without doing the lean body mass. So there have been so many definitions of sarcopenia. There have been definitions right from 1989 to 2020, the latest Bussin et al. definition which came out in 2020. A lot of things have been looked at, but three important features they have looked at. The size of the muscle, the strength of the muscle, and the function of the muscle. They looked at three important functions all the time. Three important things. The first thing is the size, the second is the, uh, the strength, and the third is the function. They looked at three, and, and, and it's a genuine combination of all these things. So look at what the revised European consensus definition and diagnosis was all about. So they had a very simple definition 2018-19 which came out which actually said find the case, assess the case, confirm the case and find the severity. So they actually found the case, they assessed the case, they actually confirmed the case and they assessed the severity. In that, the first thing that they used was something called a SARCAF. Anybody know what SARCAF or a SARCAF? It's a very simple tool actually, SARCAF. Very, very simple tool. It just says F means how much times have you fallen in a, in a year? Uh, have you had a fall in the past? You know, when you say uh, R is rising from a chair, how can you, when you're, are you able to rise up from a chair easily? You know, A is assistance in walking. Are you able to, uh, are you, do you need assistance while walking? C is, can you climb stairs effortlessly or do you need to stop? The simple, simple things, you know, that they ask. Sarkin, this is to assess or find the case. It's not the definition, it's just to find the case. You ask four, five questions. And those four, five questions, if the Sarkin criteria goes more than four, you say that this patient is probably at risk for sarcopenia and now we start defining it by actually looking at muscle strength and for muscle strength the denominator that they used is grip, hand grip dynamometer or grip strength. So grip strength is what they look or the chair stand test. Anyone knows what the chair stand test is? Anybody knows the chair stand test? A very simple test you can do to your parents actually. What is the chair stand test? Anyone? Sit up, sit up, what is it? So for a chair stand test what you normally do is, can you get the chair here? So for a chair stand test, what you do is, you have a chair of this size, which is around 17 inches, it has to be from, from down, that is 17 inches, can you sit here? So in a chair stand test, the person sits in the front, okay, he puts one hand here, he puts the other hand here, okay, he doesn't rest on the, he don't rest on the back, you sit in the front, and then you tell him to go up and down, you go up and down for 30 seconds, okay, so can you go up and down and come? So this is what the chair stand test is. So if he's able to do it, if he's able to do it, if he's able to do it on a, on, you know, quite quickly and you're able to finish 14 of those in the first 30 seconds, you basically pass your chair stand test. But this chest, this test can also be made smaller. In 12 seconds, if you can do five chair uh, up and down. In 12 seconds, if you, in 15 seconds, you go, go up and down five times, you are okay. But if you check your parents, go home and check your parents. Go home, check your parents. You'll find them that they will feel this way. You go home and check your tests. You, you find the pill the test. And that test is very well closely related to sarcopenia. That test is very closely to sarcopenia. Alright. So that's uh, that's about the chair, the chair stand test. So once <coughs> you assess the chair stand test, then you confirm the diagnosis by the use of muscle quantity or quality. Either by bioventricular impedance analysis or by a CT or an MRI or a DEXA scan. So of course you need these things to actually confirm the diagnosis of sarcopenia. And what is this confirmation when you say CT? The CT confirmation is very simple. What you do in a CT scan? You go to the CT scan, you look at L3 muscle mass. There is a there is an equation, there is a simple software, they just press it and they give you the volumes, centimeter square by meter square at the L3 level and that's what your muscle mass is all about. Simple, simple, very simple thing to do on a CT scanner. But this was what they required, that how, that's how they confirmed sarcopenia. Of course, everyone does not have a CT, MRI or a DEXA. You can't keep doing this to all patients and that's why they came up with the new definition which is the position statement of the sarcopenia definition and outcomes consortium which is called as the SDOC definition, 2020. They rumored out a lot of things of which they kept one, if any woman has got a hand grip strength of less than 20 or a man who's got a hand grip strength of less than 35.5, they actually qualify as sarcopenia. Okay, at the same time, they have a <coughs> rate speed of less than 0.8 meters per second. That means you walk across the room, if you can't do that fast, obviously you have a uh, you have sarcopenia. This is what the definition was all about. Now let's cut this across and make it much more simpler. Let's put all of these together and try to make it simpler. So let's find the case first. Okay, let's find the case. So to find the case, this is the criteria. Okay, if you want to find the case, there has to be a functional decline, an unintentional weight loss, a depressive mood, cognitive impairment, maybe repeated falls, or, or maybe malnutrition already diagnosed by NRS 2002 nutrigo or any of the scores that you know, SGA maybe. 
Okay, or you have chronic condition. More likely than not, there will be the presence of this in any of your patients. There will be a presence of this in any of your patients. Say there is no presence of these. Say there is no presence. Basically, there is no comorbid, no comorbid, comorbid <coughs> specialist, nothing having nothing, nothing at all. Then you look at those things. And the very simple tool is calf circumference. If it's less than 34 in males and less than 33 in females, it actually qualifies to say that this patient requires to be seen for sarcopenia. Okay, it requires to be seen for sarcopenia. The same SARC F criteria as them says more than four means you need to assess and confirm the diagnosis of sarcopenia in these patients because this is the person that you need to assess properly. All right, so what do you assess? So in the presence of muscle strength, that is male, in males less than 20 and females less than 18, and there is an appendicular skeletal muscle mass that is uh, less than 30, you know, less than 7, uh, less than 35.5 and 58.3. It's not written over here. So that is what the ASM criteria is. When all of them come together, it's called a sarcopenia. So this you need a BI. So by this definition, you need a BI. Okay, to do this. Okay, you need muscle strength or, or, or this. But they have also kept one more criteria in place, which is this. So if you have a six minute walk test of less than one meter per second, or a five time chair stand test of more than 12 seconds, that means five times if you have to go up and down, it takes more than 12 seconds, or a short physical performance battery, that's a completely different test, which has a lot of things inside. If that is there, yeah, they are still sarcopenic. They are still sarcopenic. All right, so this can be easily done. This is something that can be easily done. You can ask the patient, they will be able to tell you. It's so simple as that. This one. Okay, you can actually diagnose this as sarcopenia. Now, when you add one and two and three, all of these together, then it becomes severe sarcopenia. When you, when you add all of these together, it actually qualifies as severe sarcopenia, something that you have to be worried about because I just explained to you why. It's not something you'd like to do. All right, so does it really exist? The question is, does it really exist? So I did tell you that. People in this room will probably have it. All right. So, so look at this study. This is from Trinidad. A beautiful study. Okay. I want. I wanted to see the study. It's a very beautiful study, and then we're going to replicate this in our hospital. Okay. So I'm. I'm writing up a study for this. You. You guys will do it. Okay. So this. This study is uh, was published in in September 2020 from Trinidad Kim's Hospital. So what they did was they looked at a large number of patients. Um, more than 200 odd patients is what they looked at. Okay, and these are all patients in which CT scans were done for whatever purposes. It was IP patients, hospitalized patients for which CT scans were done. Just CT scans were done. And I just uh, I explained to you in order to find sarcopenia, you need to look at L3 muscle mass, muscle mass at the L3 level. It's a software that easily can be found out on on the CT scanner where they can just press it and they get an appendicular skeletal muscle mass index SMI. They get it. With that, they can tell you what is the SMI of this particular patient. It is adjusted for weight and height. Okay, they just weight and height. That's how it is. What did they find? They found that, see, this is a normal category. So there were a large number of patients that were normal CT scans. There were a large number of patients who had some benign lesions on the CT scan. There were benign lesions on the CT scan. And then there were malignant lesions on the CT scan. Okay, these were the number of patients. So 59 patients here who were, nor who were normal actually, 59 who had benign lesions, and 28 who had malignant lesions. Isn't it? Malignant lesions. And all of them were equal 45, 50, many of uh, two or three of us, or at least we are we are all at this age group actually. Alright. Uh, and what did they find here? So let's go to what they found. Okay, what they found was with patients on malignant lesions on the CT scan, 80% of them was sarcopenic. 80% of them were sarcopenic. Okay, 80% of those with malignant lesions were sarcopenic. Now you can understand how sick our patients are when they have malignancy. 80% of them actually have this. But what is most surprising is this, that when the normal category of patients also, who were hospitalized, almost 50% of them were also sarcopenic. Almost 50% of, of normal people who were hospitalized, normal, they, are normal. they didn't have a malignancy. They were also sarcopenic. It's very, very startling results. Very, And there was a similar paper that came out of the same year from Malaysia. That actually showed 59%. So the overall percentage over here was 50%. 50% of people are actually sarcopenic in the country. This is what it says. So in this room, if there are 20 of us, 10 of us are sarcopenic is what it appears. It's as bad as that. So so it is it is something that is very scary for me. I think it's very, very scary for all of us because 50% of hospitalized patients are sarcopenic and we just discussed what sarcopenia can do to the body. All right, so how do we tackle this? The question is, what do we do? I mean, is there something that we can do here? What do you think we should do, Sachin? Or Vidya, what do you think we should do? 
supplementation okay i mean supplementation is what That we do every time. What what? Decrease catabolism and you are decreasing catabolism. Sympathetic response and supply with the protein. Okay, but you know what else you want to do? You should do exercise. So you should do exercise. Okay, what else? To exercise, you know this is not done. What else you should do? Mobilization. Mobilization. So 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 yes, we are getting some very good answers. So let's look at this paper. It's a beautiful paper. Okay. So what you see on the triangles over there is a sedentary person. What is seeing on the triangles over there is sedentary. That means they are largely 80%, you know, almost 50% of their time they are sleeping. 50% of the day time they are not walking. They are on computers. They are not. They are not standing up and walking and going to the bazaar. They are probably using blanket. Zomato comes home. Okay, this is that that kind of people. All right, that's the triangle over there. The circles are the ones that are active. If there's a lift, they won't use the lift. They'll probably walk up the stairs. Okay, that's the active lifestyle. Now look at what's happening in the age group. The downward seeing on the x-axis is the age group: 24, 35, 39, 65, 70, 75, 80 plus. <coughs> what you see very classically, what classically you can uh, see is uh, the chair stand test is much better <coughs> in those patients who are in active lifestyle. Very clearly, indicating that there is a close association of active lifestyle and a reduction in sarcopenia. That is very clear, right? It's very clear so that the answer to the first question is. You have to move them. You have to move them. If you don't move them, there is not going to be any any improvement in sarcopenia. The, the person has to move. Very very important. But let me do, show you another one. Now the same patients, if they were <coughs> subjected to an aerobic exercises, what the diamond is all about, and those who are given resistance-based exercises. When you say resistance-based exercises, it means something like a theraband, something like a dumbbell that you lift, something that you lie on the floor and take up. Something that you pull down. These are resistance-based exercises that you do: push-ups, pull-ups, sitting up, sitting down. These are resistance-based exercises that you have, not aerobic. Aerobic is just walking. You know, when you have resistance, when you walk on a on a on a slope, it becomes resistance. As long as you're on the same floor, it's aerobic, all right? As long as you're burning, you're, you're you're breathing heavy, it's aerobic. Once you start doing something like this, again, resistance is resistance-based. What you can see over there is very very interesting. Uh, when you're uh, when you're fast. And you are against resistance. You see a great improvement. Let me show you that picture. So that dot over there is a 80 plus gentleman. That dot on the extreme left is a 80 plus gentleman. Okay. And the dot, second dot on the middle, is a 55 year old gentleman. So a 80 plus gentleman and a 55 year old gentleman, both, both are actually having the same chair stand test because the 80 plus gentleman was actually doing resistance based exercise. The anti-plus gentleman was doing a resistance-based exercise, and that is the reason that particular individual, though he is as old as 80 years, has the physiological age of a 50-year-old uh, person. This is what we normally see. We see some patients coming in; they don't look that, uh, they don't behave like that old person, isn't it? If you ask their lifestyle, if you ask what have they do, they've been doing, you realize, wow, this is an uh, active person who's having, who's doing really exercises, and that's why they can't be living long. So the answer to that is first to move, and the second thing is you move them fast, and it is against resistance. So these are the three two things that you see when you look at exercise per se. Okay, now what about protein? You just said supplements, you know. You said supplements. It's a very interesting molecule. Protein is very good, and this paper that comes from Pierre Singer, the place that I work, is is, is a is a beautiful paper which actually says that you actually take 70 grams of protein. All of us are taking in 70 grams of protein when we go home. We do take some 70 grams that that we take, and we oxidize those 70 grams. We oxidize those 70 grams. We get a lot of cool coming from here and there. We get a lot of cool coming from the from the muscle from here and from there. It gets into our systems, which actually helps in a lot of things. For example, um, you know, this is what we get, um, and, and 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 then the 300 gram flux occurs. 300 gram flux occurs here and there. So 300 gram goes in, 300 grams comes out. So the net nitrogen balance or the net protein balance is zero. Because two hundred grams goes in, two hundred grams comes out. There's a lot of flux happening in the in, 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 with respect to protein. But what happens when there is proteolysis is when there's critical illness, there happens proteolysis. Proteolysis means proteins are getting broken down. Okay, there's proteolysis. There's ubiquitin ubiquitinization means what? This is a very important term. What happens is whenever there is a patient in critical ill, there are certain small um, uh, kind of membrane receptors that come into the protein and prevent it from working like the way it's supposed to do. It's supposed to go and assimilate it to the amino acid. It's supposed to break down the amino acid. Then it has to be used. That doesn't occur. That is ubiquitinization. 
Okay, there is a two inflammatory response, so TNF alpha, interleukins, you know, you know, interleukins, spike alpha, all this is released, which actually prevents the synthesis that we thought about, 300 grams. All right, there is also hormonal other mediators that actually uh, cause excess breakdown too. So all these, all these things together will actually lead to a <coughs> very significant muscle loss. This will lead to very significant muscle loss. So for certain. In the ICU, in the ICU, there is going to be significant muscle loss, no doubt about it. All right. So you have, you are going from a zero balance. You were a zero balance when you started when you were healthy to actually a extremely negative balance. This is the biggest issue. And and needless to say, when we are when we are don't have any problem, we just require 0.8 grams per kilogram. And you can go up to 1.5 to 2 gram per kilogram of proteins in the event in the event that you become critically ill because you are now in a negative nitrogen balance. You know, negative nitrogen balance. Okay, so you actually go up there. So what is the definition to, uh, to how much protein do you give to these patients? The SCCM and the ASMA together says you give 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram of protein. Okay, um, and you may want to adjust it when it comes to obesity per se. Whereas the SPEN says 1.3 gram per kilogram per day is approximately what they say. So on an average, these guidelines mention 1 to 2 grams, 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram per day of protein and what they say. And how can we do this? It has to be ONS. There is nothing else. Each patient that comes, now that you know that every patient in the hospital, one in two of them are going to be sarcopenic. The only way you can do this is by oral nutritional supplements. It cannot be done otherwise. It's not possible otherwise. So every person that comes into the hospital deserves a drink, no doubt about it. They deserve a drink, okay? Because it enhances patient recovery. It causes reduction in, re in readmissions. It actually increases the intake overall. We know that when you take when you take an oral nutrition supplement, the intake does go up. Uh, there's weight gain, reduced mortality, and complication rate. So definitely, oral nutrition supplements are the way it should be done. There is no other way to do this. All right. So this. Uh, uh, when they actually looked at, so now which oral nutrition supplement, that also comes to our mind, isn't it? If you say oral awareness, it just can't be a thing, there's so much in the market, there's more than 7,000 supplements now at this given moment, okay, in the market. So what do we, what do we use here? So what they did was they looked at a large number of studies, large number of studies, that's the number of studies they looked at, 516 studies they looked at, 516 studies, okay. And they looked at all the systematic reviews that are there, and they made an umbrella systematic review. So they looked at all these studies, looked at the best systematic reviews, and took 15 of them out. Okay, after they found out, they took 15 of them out. So this is the umbrella review of a systematic review. It's a big systematic review, basically. And what they found was three simple things. Leucine, HMV, and resistance training. They just found these three things. They found leucine works, they found HMV is good, and third thing is resistance training is the way it should be done. Okay, so these three things are the ones that actually improves strength, function, and physical performance. Right? That is the only way that our patients can actually get better. So leucine, HMV, and resistance training. To an extent that HMV is equivalent to a steroid that is equal to anabolic steroid. You know this? HMV is equal to anabolic steroid. It's equal to that. So bodybuilders now abroad, who used to be anabolic steroids are not taking HMV. All right, huh? it is the end product of leucine after all. Leucine is the, is the protein that takes down the HMV. Now you're getting HMV on its own. And you just take the HMV on uh, HMV and you become, you become like, uh, uh, and you do physical training, resistance training, and you, you definitely develop your muscle size. So does this awareness make a difference? Does this awareness make a difference? Yes, it does. So this study is done in KEM, okay? Our KEM hospital. All right. We, I mean, Dr. Reddy was a part of the study. Uh, Dr. Marate, the dietitian in KEM, they were part of the study. Okay, what they did, very interesting, what they did. They looked at 212 patients, 212 people, and they gave one group ONS. They just gave one group ONS. Of them, every day, two ONS, one in the morning, one in the evening. And one group they kept as controlled, where they didn't give ONS, they just gave them water. So they drank just water. So there was a group that actually kept ONS, and there was another group that actually uh, got just water. So what happened in these cases? So very interesting. Okay, so look at these patients. They were all 40 years, 39 years, male, female, nourishment, everything was there. And there what is the CRP levels? Everything was there. They, they, they gave them the same amount of nutrition though. So it's a very difficult study to do. They gave them the same amount of nutrition also. They gave them, you eat this, you eat this. But in addition to this eating, you also have ONS. That is all they said. In addition to your eating, you have to ONS. So what they did, beautiful study actually. And what they found, look at what, 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 what they found over here. Okay, let me go back. Okay. So this is week 4, week 8, and week 12. They looked at the change in handle. Look at the change in handle. 
can see the strength, the hand grip is a very important diameter which actually tells you strength. What they found very clearly is those patients who had uh, who were on oral nutrition supplements, if you look at the hand grip, they actually improved as compared to that that was on controls. Very, very, very interesting study. And then subsequently look at this. At week 12, uh, if you look at baseline weight change, the ones who had ONS was on 3.39. <coughs> you know, that's the mean that they had, whereas the control was 1.9 for half. Absolutely half. So what does it say? You give the ONS, irrespective of what you have the patient, if they have come to your hospital, if they are ill, give it to them and they deserve it for at least 12 weeks. They deserve it for at least 12 weeks is what it looks like. Okay, along with what you're doing, uh, you actually give a designer protein nowadays with HMVDUC and a physical resistance exercises. Right, so ONS really matters, there's no doubt about it. ONS matters and it's no doubt. This is not the only study, there are studies all across the world that says the same thing. But this I showed you because it's an Indian study done in our city and that is why you should know about this particular study. Alright, so you look at the hand grip strength, the, it completely changes, look at the blue ones compared to the red ones. There is so much of difference in the hand grip strength with ONS versus control. And also look at that, the body weight has also changed, that's what it says at week 12, the ones with ONS had a big change in the body weight. Very clearly indicating that increased weight and increased strength is related to the ONS. So that's why ONS does matter, there's no doubt about it. So by now, you would have realized that sarcopenia is very, very prevalent. You know that it is more so in the hospitalized patients. Proteins and resistant training is the answer, okay? Not just any protein. It has to be a designer protein like you see in our HMP. Okay? Not only during hospitalization, but at least 24 weeks after hospitalization. It should be that way. And now, can Ronnie go home and pick up his child? If he does all these things? Mostly yes, he can. He can do this, Ronnie can do it, and, and he can do it now, because we now know what we should do for him. So thank you very much for this. Any questions here? Any questions, <coughs> Any questions on this? Okay. Okay. And uh, these resistive exercises in the ICU. So there is a so there is so in the ICU. Like cycling or so there are various <coughs> ways to do this. There are various ways to do it. So, uh, yeah. so I can tell you. Cycling in the so so what you said is ergometry. So in 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 uh, I, I was working in a hospital where we did a lot of rehab services in ICU. Okay. So the hospital where I worked it had a cycle at the uh, at the uh, on the bed which could be mounted on the bed. And there was a screen in the front, so you're cycling and you're, you feel you're going through a village or going through things. Something like that was there. Cycling is one thing that can be done. But so, the most simple thing is is, is two, two things. One is just a TheraBand exercise. Yes. Okay, a TheraBand exercise. You can just take a TheraBand. It's so simple to do. And the person can actually just do a TheraBand exercise. That's resistance training. Okay, uh, they, it's, it, they can actually be seated on the chair and told, please get up from the chair. That's a, against resistance exercise. It's as simple as that. Okay, just get up from your bed. Just get up from your bed, make him move, make him sit, make him stand. That's that's resistance-based exercises. If it's possible, a, a dumbbell given to the person at this particular moment and taking it up, even five pounds is fine. Even five pounds is fine, 2.5 pounds is also fine. That is also enough as resistance exercises. Because these patients cannot do these things. They can't even do this 2.5 dumbbells. So uh, even the small dumbbells can actually work in, in exercises. But the answer is the moment you feel, that this person or you feel that I can move this person, you should move this person. It is not whether that person can move. Whether I can move this person, it is the other way around. So if the patient is on the ventilator, I know he can't move, but we will still move the person because I can move that person. You know, it's, it's like that. So it's important to move every every individual that is there in the intensive care unit. Yeah. Any other questions? Is there any particular amount of which should be getting for different yeah, so HMB, as of now, the exact amount is not known. What you get in supplements is 4 to 6 grams. But on an average, you should reach at least 12 to 16 grams. Per day? Yeah, per day. 12 to 16 grams is an average you should receive. Recent trials on HMB? Yeah, yeah, multiple trials on HMB. In fact, yeah, most of the trials that have come in is in, actually, most of the trials are not in recovery of critical health. They are most in post-operative nutrition support. Forms. But they, they said anywhere between 12 to 16 grams. What we get in our supplements is 3, three grams and 2 grams. We, we, we need to go up higher. Similarly, the case with arginine. If you want to give arginine, you have to give it at 12 grams, not at 2 grams or 3 grams of water supplement. There is a difference for different case, like specifically for which For which supplement? So, HIV is. So, burns, the protein requirements are extremely high. So you may go to 2.5 grams per kilogram. If you visit the Ironic Burn Center, they give 3 grams a kilogram. Yeah. Hmm? 
the early birth center gives 3 grams per kilogram. In fact, when I did speak to the doctor, he said we give, we give 3 grams per kilogram. And still they don't assimilate. In burns, it's a very different pathology that's occurring. In burns, you get cachetic. It's like cancer. So you, you whatever you give doesn't really work well. So we don't know what to do in burns, but you could probably give higher than higher. You know, one, one trivia, you can't give more than 3 grams per kilogram, it won't work. It will not work. It's not supposed to work. Okay, it's not work, but in burns, it does work. That's the only place where you can give more than three grams. Any other questions? There should be education to the patients also, and those who are yeah. So, so the entire point is when you go home, you get a drink in your hand. That's how it should be. Then only it works. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Everyone should get a drink when they go. Home. Everyone. That's why if you see when we are prescribing, we prescribe for three months. We write on the notes, give for three months. Is it it? 